Hi. <laughs> okay, well, welcome everybody, and thank you for coming out on a Monday night, which is never a great night. But it's great that you're all here, and I guess there are lots of people online as well. And this is to launch a new book, Afghanistan Long War Forgotten Peace, and it's certainly a very, very long war, is it? It's over 40 years. December the 25th, 1979, I dated from Soviet intervention. Yeah, there you go. exactly. And 79, that makes it 43 years. So this session is to discuss the book. It's called Afghanistan, the Death of Liberal Internationalism? And I think we all have views about that. But I just wanted to say one thing. I just feel that what happened in the summer of 2021 was such a tragedy, and a tragedy that really could have been avoided, and with the most incredible irresponsibility on the part of the international actors. Uh, and it's still a tragedy, and I think what's worse is that for about six months, everybody was deeply concerned and they were worrying about where the Afghans were going and they were worrying about jobs for Afghans and then came the war in Ukraine. And nobody's talking about Afghanistan and perhaps, you know, the number of people who came this evening is a sign of that. If we'd held it before the invasion of Ukraine, I think it would have been packed. Yeah. And it's such a tragedy and such a continuing tragedy some of which is reflected in this book. So to talk about it, we have Mick Cox, who has done a brilliant job in editing and a nice, clear introduction, yeah. which tells you everything you need to know about. <laughs> Not everything you need that's to know. You do need to still read the rest of the book. That does help, yeah, please. I buy it. And we'll start with Mick, who is Professor Emeritus of International Relations and who founded LSE Ideas, which is hosting this, and has, everyone remembers him for his brilliant lectures <coughs> and also many books. Okay, Mary, thank you very much. And firstly, thank you to all the speakers who will be speaking after me. Um, Michael Williams, old, a young friend, I should say not an old friend, Michael, who did his PhD here at the LSE, and my old friend there again. Caroline Kennedy Piper, who I've known for many, many years. It's wonderful to be on the same platform with them, and of course, again, with my old comrade, as we used to use the old term, uh, Mary. Um, in a way, this is a book launch, but it's not a book launch. Basically, we want, we want to kind of widen the debate from thinking about what happened in Afghanistan and what its implications are for Afghanistan, first and foremost, uh, but also for the region and also for the world order, and what this means for that thing which is often called the liberal international order. Uh, a couple of thanks must go firstly to LSE Press. I'm glad to see it's up and running again and, and, and represented here this evening, that's great. Uh, it, it's great that LSE has started a press again or got going again with its press and I'm glad that it's doing the kind of work that it's doing here, particularly on Afghanistan. Uh, and I'm also going to add it's another volume because this one has been relatively successful, in fact, very successful. I'm going to do another one on Ukraine, which will be finished by the by September of this year. So two crises, two tragedies. Uh, and it seems that I've been made, made the editor of these. I didn't cause the tragedy, of course. Um, let's just say something about the book itself. Um, there's about 11 essays in it, in my introduction. The essays try to cover, they're short, I think readable, um, they try to cover a variety of the main main issues. They don't cover everything. You can't do it. But I think as edited books go, I think it's pretty coherent and, and pretty complete. It starts with a rather remarkable essay by a man who was the last British ambassador to the Soviet Union, a rather remarkable guy called Sir Roderick Braithwaite, who wrote a book on Afghanistan and the Soviet intervention into Afghanistan. I've known Roderick for many years. He's wise brilliant, funny, and I think says some very good things in that about the need to understand history in trying to understand Afghanistan, and he focuses on that. I suppose his argument is, his thesis is, 
don't go around thinking you can build nations in countries very, very easily. I think that's, part, that's the kind of rather pessimistic, illiberal, if you like, non-liberal conclusion that Roderick uh, uh, arrives at. Not all of all the authors in the book say that, but that's certainly Roderick, a wise diplomat of 50 years, you know, reflecting back. But again, it begins with that. We then move on to thinking about some very key questions. I suppose the, the four or five big questions is, why did the Taliban come back? And why, therefore, did they go on to win? Because that was not predicted. It wasn't inevitable. Uh, but they have won with consequences which are now unfolding in, as Mario says, in a, in a, in a hugely tragic, tragic way. Uh, I suppose the other way of putting it is, why did NATO lose? Which is another way of saying, why did the United States decide to get out? Because in this regard, it wasn't a NATO decision. It was a US decision taken by President Joe Biden, and before that, of course, prepared the way by President Donald Trump. So although this does have a chapter in the book about NATO, which I think is right, because it was the largest NATO intervention since the end of the Cold War, in fact, it's the biggest ever, uh, nonetheless, the, um, the role of the United States in this was absolutely crucial. Demonstrating something which I've, I've always thought was pretty self-evident, uh, that the US still is the most dominant power within the world, and within the NATO alliance, by far and away the most dominant. It claimed that it consulted, that it's a weird form of consultation, many people know, that we're going to get out for all of Boris Johnson's efforts. Uh, you remember Boris Johnson, I hope. But for all of Boris Johnson's efforts to try to uh, convince the Americans they should stay, it made absolutely no difference whatsoever to the decision-making process. And as Mary points out, and I agree with her entirely, the consequences of that decision, the way it was done, uh, were, were tragic then. It was clearly going to be tragic, and it's unfolded into a tragedy both economically uh, and in terms of human beings, in terms of refugees, in terms of the position of women, and in terms of the position of nearly all citizens uh, within, within Afghanistan, uh, as we've been seeing on our screens. But as Mary also said, six months after the departure of NATO forces, US forces, from Kabul, you, you, I think we can all remember the images really st struck me. I've got a few big images in my mind for the last 20 years, you know, the 9-11 moment, etc. One of the big images in my mind is, is that last plane leaving, leaving Kabul airport. Uh, that decision was, is, it had huge consequences and will continue to do so. Um, what I try to do in the book and what others try to do in the book is then think about what impact that's going to have, not only inside Afghanistan, but also outside. Two of the chapters, by the way, deal with the question of women and its consequences, and I, Caroline will speak about that this evening. Two also deal with uh, drugs, because part of the whole question of drugs, that we, when, we were in, when I was heading up LSE Ideas, we set up a, a drugs project, and led by John Collins, who now works down in Vienna. And, and John and his, his, his co-workers put together two excellent chapters on, on, the, on the drugs trade and how, it, how drugs themselves have become a very integral part of this story. So if you think this is just about what's happening inside Afghanistan, think of the spin-out effects of, of, of all this as well. But as Mary said, what happened, and what's tragic, and another tragedy on top of another one, was that on the 24th of February of 2022, basically nearly one year ago, uh, Putin, against, all, against the advice of most of his advisors, actually, including the most appalling foreign minister Russia's ever had, Sergei Lavrov, as far as I can see, uh, even he was surprised by that decision to, to, to invade, um, taken completely aback if you kind of read the details at the moment. And, uh, and that, in a way, has overlaid, as Mary suggested, has overlaid the thinking about Afghanistan, as Mary said, it's optimistically, but I think it's true. If it hadn't been for the Ukraine war, we would still be talking more about Afghanistan. I think there's absolutely no... It pushed it off the front pages. It pushed it off page two, it pushed it off page three. It may not even figure at all, except in the very occasional uh, responsible journalist who goes there and talks about, or some of the NGOs, who still work there, by the way, very bravely, I must say, I give them all the credit in the world for the kind of work they've been doing out there. 
to kind of remind us of what the consequences of our decisions are, the decisions of Western powers, and before that the Soviet Union, who should not be let off the hook on this one, by the way, uh, as, to the, as to the tragedy that has unfolded. Now, I'll only say two other things and then hand over to my, other, my two other friends along. Mary obviously will make her own intervention. Does it, did it mean and does it mean and how has it contributed towards the kind of crisis of liberal internationalism? Um, and I think it would, one would be pretty blind uh, or tin-eared, as they say, to think that it didn't. I mean, in a way, this didn't begin in 2001 as a liberal inter intervention. It began as an anti-terrorist intervention to kill the Taliban and to drive them out. But it became, a, it, it was then overlaid with what I would call a liberal project. Maybe Mike can talk about, about that and why, why that happened. And of course, the very way of, the fact of getting out, the way the West got out, has raised the question, which of course, uh, Roger Braithwaite Suggest you know, raises in his very first chapter. This therefore means you shouldn't go around trying to liberal nation build. This was a failure of liberalism. This was a failure of thinking you can impose new kinds of liberal, stroke on stroke, Western liberal norms on society which, quote unquote, are not ready for it. And, and in that sense, therefore, the, the way of the withdrawal, the nature of the withdrawal, and what we've seen since, clearly has produced a major crisis of, of, of kind of liberal conscience. And the whole and the whole liberal project. I don't think we 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 can ignore that. Um, that doesn't mean, in my view, that the the project itself was in in of itself wrong. I want to make that distinction as well, um, because I think that so many of the people who were involved in, in in Afghanistan on the western side, not all by any means, no, not at all, but very many of them actually went there with the best of intentions. To do what I would call good things, like build schools, create the conditions for women's education, uh, create a kind of infrastructure for civil society. It's easy to lose sight of that now, but I think it's something we still need to be reminded about, because too often I think we do forget about it, and simply to subsume the whole idea that it's merely an imperialist project and therefore it went the way of all imperialist projects and failed. I still want to kind of hold on to the notion, and some in this audience may legitimately disagree with me, that the actual intentions of many of those who were involved, <coughs> including the NGOs who were involved in a very big way in, in Afghanistan, that many of their intentions and, their, and what they were trying to seek to do was not at all bad and should therefore, we should hold on to that rather than do the, the, the root branch rejection of the notion of the liberal project. The second point I make, Mary, and I'll end here just with a kind of throwaway remark, whether or not, and this has been raised by a number of my American friends, and I, again, I'd be interested to hear what Michael says on this, whether or not the liberal project has had a reboot because of the Afghanistan war. I mean, I've heard this said many, many times. Okay, we lost the liberal project in, in Afghanistan. Because the Ukraine war, I beg pardon, yeah. Because of the Ukraine war, thanks, Mary. Uh, the, 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 the liberal project has been given a reboot. The West has been given a reboot because of the Ukraine war. It, it's kind of re, 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 kind of invigorated the notion of the West, what the West stands for in relationship to what's been going on in Russia. Now, I think that's a that's a, that's a, an argument. I think we need to have rather than simply assert it as a truth, because I think this war has still a very, very, very long way. To go because there ain't any peace around the corner. In spite of Chinese peace plans, the Russians didn't want one. I don't think the Americans, the Ukrainians don't want a peace at the moment because the Ukrainians don't think this is a peace that will be on terms that are in any way favorable to, to Ukraine because they want Ukraine back, to put it rather bluntly. And in some ways, I don't blame them. Um, so I think we should be a bit careful to say, well, we lost the liberal project in Afghanistan, but we're going to regain it. Uh, in, in Ukraine. But nonetheless, it does pose the more general crisis and the more general question of what is a liberal internationalist foreign policy? Can we implement it? Or should we abandon it altogether to the realists and simply say it's just about state power, it's just about the balance of power and the fundamental moral issues, ethical issues, human rights issues which are part of the liberal project, it could also be part of the social democratic project, about which I feel quite happy, 
has is, has all that been thrown out as well? And I would like to think not. As, as as we go forward. So Mary, on those few comments, I'll, I'll conclude. No, that, actually, I think I agree with you. Um, it was really distressing the way after the Afghan war, it was treated as a failure of the liberal project and a failure of nation building. And I think the UN and indeed the NATO effort, which was under the UN, there was always an incredible tension between that and the American anti-terrorist mm. agenda. Mm. Mm. And actually, I think uh, a chapter by Florian Weigand and some of the other mm. chapters really do show that the war on terror undermined the Liberal Project. Mm. And I think the Liberal Project could have succeeded. And I also get very irritated when you know, people like Roderick Breakwaite say, <laughs> oh, you know, we should have learned from history. These are these tribal conservative people who can never change. And when you think about Afghanistan, a large number of people had been refugees, had been displaced people, had been exposed to international ideas. They were a lot more sophisticated than the outsiders gave them credit. And I think that's also an important argument mm. for us to make. Mm. And the other point I wanted to, make, to raise <coughs> is that I was wondering where, what role Brexit played in all this. It's, it's kind of interesting because I think, <coughs> in general, probably the EU is better off without Britain. But that in foreign policy, I think Britain was very important. And I feel the European members of NATO mm. would have taken a much stronger position had the UK mm. not left. And, and, you know, people in the UK were strongly against the withdrawal, but so were many people in Europe. But they felt they somehow... And the argument that they didn't have capacity was absolute nonsense, but I could go into it. But I feel it was really a weakness that the European members of NATO couldn't bring themselves to stop what was happening. So I think that's an interesting issue that we might want to talk about. So I, I, I was told I was allowed to talk as chair. So that's why I'm talking as we go along. But I'm going to turn to Caroline Pike Kennedy, who is, I should look you up, but you're a professor at Loughborough University and is very well known for her work on war and security, who's written, together with a colleague who's in the audience, a really fascinating chapter about the issue of women's rights and the changes that came about. And particularly interesting, I found, was the role of women in Western armies. I thought that was a really interesting aspect of the whole story, but she's going to tell us about all that. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Um, so Nick tasked me with talking about the death of liberal internationalism along with the chapter that Afi and I co-wrote on women in Afghanistan. And thank you, Nick, for allowing us to be part of that. Okay. So I think I'd start by reiterating the point that Nick Cox made, which is that the irony of both Afghanistan but also Iraq is that we now think of them as failed wars to promote democracy and liberal wars. But really, they were in their essence about a counter-terror mission, particularly Afghanistan in its first incarnation. Mm. And I think we've forgotten, uh, Fiona and I were talking earlier about once you get to our age, about how the past looks. But it's easy to forget in the post 9-11 environment, the environment of fear, conspiracy, intelligence failure that really dogged American decision making and those of you who know, I have former students in the audience, uh, thank you for coming. I never ever thought really of 9-11 as a new beginning, but I've always thought of 9-11 as, if you like, an ending in terms of the long shadows cast by the Cold War. The last gasp. Exactly. <laughs> so in that sense, Kosovo, the Balkans, uh, these were all as was 9-11, in my view, really the end game for many of the consequences, the Iranian revolution, the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan, 
the American um, sponsor of Osama bin Laden through the CIA. All of these things did not come out of nowhere. But I think the point is that Iraq and Afghanistan began, rightly or wrongly, as it turned out wrongly, really to be about uh, WMD, terrorism, foreign shelters, those failed governments who give succor to American enemies, knowing very little actually about the realities of the country, um, but really to see them in that infamous phrase, Afghan, Iraq, just simply hiding places, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And I think that this it becomes hugely important to the American view of why Afghanistan Taliban had to be removed and the country reshaped. And of course, we're all aware of mission creep here, uh, that original counter terror mission. Mort, I agree with Nick, through very, very well intentioned principles. I note that early intention that the women of Afghanistan had to be emancipated. That became a mantra for President Bush and those around him. And all the consequences, never mind the fact that, again, we're asking the women to do the work. But that supposition that if women can be emancipated, society will inevitably follow and be reshaped. Uh, a classic, a classic error, and I'll come on to that. And then what I find interesting is that these wars became wars of choice, not wars of necessity, in the way that I are there is thought about them. Actually, they were seen absolutely as wars of necessity in that original counter-terror um, guise. But of course, I think what's so interesting is that what we've seen, particularly with the United States, is the ability to shrug off the mistakes of war. Of course, Vietnam still resonates. But nevertheless, the Americans move very quickly away from thinking of Iraq as indispensable as actually a place, a region, peoples who could be um, just let loose and look at all the consequences and the misreading of what that war actually came to mean in the Middle East, never mind the failed reading of the Arab Spring. But when we come, I think, to liberal internationalism, I, I don't think we should delude ourselves, despite a few people of good purpose and good principle. Usually these wars interventions are about the status quo. They're about retaining some form of Western dominance. It's about dealing with the boundaries that are and rebuking those who might wish to change. And if you think of, for example, the way that liberal internationalism works, it's about the promotion of stability, of course, but it's also about the promotion of economic prosperity for certain states in the system, if not others. And if you think about the Cold War, that much vaunted in John Lewis Gaddis's phrasing, a fairy tale in which Europe was subdued, peace and stability operated at the global level. Well, let's think about those consigned to their fate on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Or let's think about the numerous brutal and bloody wars that broke out throughout the Cold War. It was not peaceable for most people outside a very small part of Western Europe. And of course, in all of that, the Soviet Union was only part of the problem. The wars that broke out to defend the Monroe Doctrine, I'm sure you know, we have Americans here, those wars in Latin and Central America had very little to do with the logic of stability and prosperity or human rights, but far more to do with a certain reading of what constituted liberal internationalism. Russia in the 1990s was not a problem for the West because it was Yeltsin's basket case. And even as NATO expanded eastwards, and I'm not somebody who believes that that is the sine qua non of why Putin has invaded Ukraine. Nevertheless, there is a reminder here about sidelining powerful states even those with GDPs the size of Spain, of allowing a state to feel outside, allowing grievances to rise. And Nick and I have talked about this. Even before Putin comes to power, Bill Clinton, no less, is warned by Yeltsin of what will follow 
after Yeltsin's speech, quite clear that the forces of the right, of an ultra-Russian nationalism, will take the field. But all that ignored in the West, all of it ignored. Russia regarded no longer as a great power, even while all of that anger, that historical interpretation of what Russia should be. Remember Putin's claim that the dissolution of the Soviet Union was a great geopolitical tragedy, perhaps the greatest in 20th century history. So my point is that our reading of history come Afghanistan, come Iraq, is a complete misreading, I think, of the Cold War and the legacies that it had left. I would also say 9-11 um, should have taught us, perhaps it did for a while, the importance of ideology, the importance of religious sentiment, the ability of the charismatic, the weaker, the wreckers, that crucially, war does not resolve the basic problems of international relations. It does not resolve the basic patterns of human agency, action, and ugliness. What military intervention usually does is pour more misery on the same. And in that, those that suffer are the civilians. And we've seen that in Afghanistan in terms of the women, the children, the displaced, the refugees. So Ukraine, we talk about quite rightly Putin's barbaric attacks on civilians. But let us not pass the veil over 150,000 dead in Iraq on the other side. Let us not look away from what saturation bombing, strategic bombing, has done in Syria. Let alone a Libya, a campaign which is relatively understudied. <clears throat> so let me pause and stop with a few re reflections on my view of liberal internationalism. I think that there is a failure to recognize almost the impossibility of reason ever creating a political consensus about the nature of justice. And that is what we have seen in Afghanistan. Reason alone will not bring about political consensus about the rights of individuals, community rights, or women. Practically impossible to imagine that. Can we think of alliances and associations of global politics in which there is no higher political objective to reshape others? Can we think of an associate, association, a tolerance of states in which to be different can be accepted? Was part of the problem in Afghanistan was running right up. And I'm not going to agree with Roderick Braithwaite about the instability or the barbarism of tribal peoples, but to point to the profound difficulties of changing people's minds, economically, socially, and ideologically. Can we think about war as really about a common interest, a common purpose in the international sphere? Because I think not. I think that war always divides, particularly as we've seen when war proves to be durable, expensive, and costly. Can we get to a science of peace? I doubt it. Can we think of peace as enduring as, as Kant might have it? And I would say that I think part of the problem is that what we try to do through liberal internationalism is just underscore the legitimacy of war for whatever purpose use just war theory to make the case for us. And in particular, if we look at Iraq, for example, as Richard Watmore has argued, what we're actually looking at are the justifications of the faces, the look no hands, new tricks, politicians who have taken us into these wars. And I would also say we need to think about the United States positioning itself as the indispensable nation that 9-11 allowed the revocation of human rights, of the norms that had governed most of the international system, or at least in theory, torture, extraordinary rendition, black sites, all justified in terms of the rights of an indispensable nation 
to reshape the world in its own image, wherever possible. And I would say that there's a problem here, that this all occurs politically while most states are still addicted to economic warfare. So even if you're not looking at military intervention, you will certainly be keenly aware of economic warfare. My dear friend, the late Nicholas Renger, used to make a very dark joke. Uh, he argued that if Blair and Bush had ever read Montesquieu, they would know the impossibility of forcing one form of government with a history into another place with a different history. Which is not to say it should not be attempted, but that there should be a very keen awareness of historical precedents and sociological trends. And what I would really like to say is that I think this notion that liberal internationalism is about the promotion of sovereignty is really quite wrong. Because very few states are truly sovereign. Most states um, are not masters of their own destiny. And to come back to Mary, let me say that I think that this is probably one of the greatest fallacies in my heart, that any state can be master of its own destiny. Brexit, the idea of mastery of one's destiny without friends, without allies, it's impossible to think of. And so what I would say is what I think liberal internationalism, um, it has failed uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, the country is now a byword for poverty, for corruption, for all of those things that we sought to eliminate after 9-11. And so my question would be to those who are younger in the audience, how, if the project is deemed worthwhile, can it be reinvigorated? And I suspect the answer is not through a war. Well, thank you very much, Caroline. I think I'm not quite as pessimistic as you. <laughs> <laughs> I do think there are differences between the role the international community played in the Balkans and Iraq and Afghanistan. And for me, the tragedy of Iraq and Afghanistan was really the quite constructive trends in the 90s were upended. And, you know, if we, and I also think, I completely agree with you that war is impossible nowadays. And if we've learned anything from the Ukraine invasion, it's that. It's the lesson the Americans ought to have learned from Korea, they ought to have learned it from Vietnam, they ought to have learned it from Iraq, they ought to have learned it from Afghanistan. Invading other countries is impossible nowadays because military, all forms of military technologies, including improvised explosive devices, are so destructive that you can't win. But that doesn't mean there aren't situations where military force could be useful in cases of genocide or massive human rights violations. But how that military force is used is as important as why. And that's what I think went wrong in Kosovo. But I'll be talking too long if I go into all of that. But I think the interesting thing is that the EU's defence policy did move in that during the 90s. And um, at the moment, I mean, I'm completely fascinated by the debate within NATO, which is going on, which is, you know, I think there really are possibilities of a change of direction. And I don't think it's just about reason. I think it's also self-interest. I mean, these wars are really stupid. I mean, I guess there are particular people who do benefit from them. <laughs> But in general, if you're particularly if you're a realist, you must realise that the national interest doesn't benefit from these kinds of wars. It's only very specific. It's about state capture, if you like. So, um, though, to, though to be fair to the realists, but before we bring in Mike, most of the realists were opposed to the Iraq intervention, and most of the most critical, most critical people in relationship to Afghanistan are realists. In other words, they said, that's, you know, you should just leave societies alone. They will evolve in their own particular way, recognize the boundaries and that the imposition of quote unquote liberal values on societies which are quote unquote not ready for it or not, or have a different history 
and the realist in that sense, I suppose, come out of this, I'm not sure, smelling of roses quite, but in a way kind of smirking a bit, I think, actually, at the end of all this. I don't know if you agree with that, Car I, Caroline, or, or something. What do you think? I, I think that... If that's a way of putting it, I don't know. If it's a way of putting it, quite. Um, would, would realists take that view, or, or would they have a deep pessimism about any project to reshape the human condition okay. and the yeah. nature of humanity. I, I agree, they were like that. I mean, the realists took that position. They took an anti rafael position. Okay. I just listened to John Mearsheimer on the Ukraine cost. Oh, yes. Well, he so, blames it on liberalism, doesn't he? He says it was totally, the West's fault. It's, he says it's the West's mm. fault. You know, he takes the same view as the far left and the far right. But anyway, so... Michael. My, so our final speaker is Michael Williams, who's at the University of Syracuse, and he's written about Afghanistan, the Good War. I don't know if you still think that. Because well, it wasn't declarative. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Mike. And um, so we'll hear what he has to say about the death of international liberalism. Um, so it's a pleasure to uh, be here, be back at the LSE since this is where I did my doctorate uh, and got to know uh, Mary and, and Nick. Um, and then, of course, Caroline's work is on all the reading lists. So it's really an honor to be here with the three of you and for you all turning out on a windy Monday night in, uh, is it March now? It's time's flying by, March. Uh, so thanks for coming. Um, I think by way of background, I'm actually an expert on transatlantic relations in NATO and Europe. Um, and when I was started doing that in the late 90s, and I Russian and German and everyone said, that's so old hat that, you know, the Cold War is over, Russia's not our enemy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's, oh, that's what I do. And that's how I actually ended up in Afghanistan, is that I um, sort of got hijacked into doing basically program evaluation. And actually, Mary did some for the UN, and I was actually doing it for NATO, but doing some with the EU and the UN and NATO, and trying to analyze the situation, and, which led to private reports and then a bunch of articles and the book the Good War, which we debate whether there should be a question mark there, uh, but it was the, the subtitles, uh, you know, um, NATO and the liberal conflicts in Afghanistan, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so about the efficacy, actually, of what we're talking about, whether this can be achieved. Um, and I have to say, too, just on a personal note, as someone who worked there and got to know Afghanistan and many Afghans, you know, what, what the way things went down last year was really horrific, um, very painful. I, I actually had lunch with a good British friend today who's my age, um, and I think this colors a lot of thinking of the certain generation, because it's we're that generation who went to war. And he's this pole ad, a British pole ad in Helmand. And um, he, uh, to this day, he, you know, if a dog barks, he, he hits the floor, right? He has terrible PTSD um, from his time there. You know, and so we, we, we were carrying consequences domestically. The highest, uh, uh, most veterans die in the United States of suicide. And that's still a major problem, right? It's something we don't talk about. It's a major burden on the healthcare system, but more importantly on those individuals and their families. So we're carrying a lot of trauma from this conflict. So I unfortunately got to deal with it a lot, and it's nice to be here to think about it, because it has just totally dissipated. And what my friend said about a year ago was, how does it feel that everything you worked on for about a decade or 15 years of your life, in your, the best part of your life, when you're in your 20s and 30s, um, it is, is irrelevant. Right? So it's great that you're thinking about it, and I think there are very important lessons, as all the previous speakers have drawn out, to things that are actually happening in Ukraine and to the wider idea of the so-called uh, liberal international order. So a uh, few thoughts. Um, so and I, the book is great. It's pithy, which is difficult to do. Um, it covers most of the waterfront. I have a couple critiques I'll air, um, but it's really a great uh, collection. Um, I thought, Caroline, I, love, I really liked your comment. Um, talking about how the U.S. approached um, the, the challenges of the sort of late 90s and early 90s, right? And I think uh, critical geopolitics and draw to all would call it like the statization, like, you know, the problem of um, terrorism becomes the problem of failed state, right? I.e. Afghanistan. And the problem of nuclear proliferation becomes, and WMD becomes the problem of Iraq, right? Even though these are broader transnational problems, they don't fit easily in our matrix of understanding. And I think that undergirds a lot of exactly what happened in this specific case of Afghanistan, why we approached it um, with military tools, uh, with certain timelines, and perhaps unrealistic expectations, which led us down a road. I was running a, I'm running a course this semester, and we were dissecting um, part of a NATO mission. 
and the students ask me questions I'm presenting on NATO's approach, well, were the development people there to make the environment permissive for the military, or were the military people there to guard the development people? And uh, well, there's no answer to that. I mean, you'll get 50 answers, but there wasn't. I mean, this was, it was a circle, right? Uh, and I, I wrote a book on it and papers, and it drives NATO on it, and it, it's a circle. I mean, the students picked up on that immediately, right? So what are some of the challenges? The first one, um, it was always stated that we were there to support Afghan goals. But ultimately, and I think the withdrawal demonstrates that, and, and I think there's a lot of good intentions, and I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a middle ground person. I'm definitely not a realist, Nick, so I hope I wasn't supposed to be a no, realist. No, no, okay. no, no, no. Um, but not a realist. Um, but uh, I'm an English school theorist. I went to the LSE. Um, so uh, anyways, um, it was Western goals versus Afghan goals. And I think that that is, and it was, a, it was Western-driven projects, not Afghan-driven. Right? I think that's a fundamental flaw in that approach. You want to have a takeaway of if you think you might do this somewhere else, to what extent are you really doing things for your own national agenda versus what are you actually doing them for the Afghans? And what are you actually creating capacity? Um, and, and you saw this time and again on both the civilian and the military sides of the missions. I actually did a, a work on the UK one for Operation Herrick. And when they went in, the DFID team, well, may she rest in peace, DFID, uh, uh, came back and wrote a report and basically said, UK objectives in Helmand, not achievable. And the cabinet office said, no, 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 can't do it, can't say that, and crossed it out and, and then changed some things and then put the report forward. But that wasn't the report that the development experts wrote, right? So I think that that's important, right? Who are you actually supporting the goal of the people you're trying to help in the society and the community or your own political goals? And in Afghanistan, it was really our own political goals by and large. Um, Another major issue which, which is addressed in the book, and a critical one that was often overlooked, Caroline also mentioned it, political settlement. There was never any political settlement to this conflict, right? So uh, the Taliban were not nice people. Uh, they did host Osama bin Laden, and that was when they wouldn't give him up. Uh, the Bush administration decided to oust them from power uh, and then hunt down the, the actual terrorists, which weren't actually the Taliban. They were trying to hunt down al-Qaeda. Uh, and the Taliban realized, we're not going to fight the U.S. They drifted away. There could be many books on this. Um, but there was, this was never a peacekeeping mission. Um, it really ended up being a peacemaking mission. In the beginning, I, it, I can explain why it morphed that way. But the idea was we're going to we're going to rebuild Afghanistan because we're not doing Iraq, and it was Canada, Turkey, and Germany that sort of segued this mission that the U.S. had no intention of staying. Mm -hmm. I have a memo from Donald Rumsfeld I was reading for the plan, which was we're done, we're getting out, and it was the Iraq war, <laughs> and these countries were like, we want to support the United States in this war on terror, but uh, we're not going to do this. So Afghanistan became this pr project of well-intentioned liberal uh, internationalism, and, and, and rooted in a belief that we can make the world better in the future um, through progressive right, war. And but you can't do that if you don't have the society at peace with itself, which never occurred because the Taliban were deemed illegitimate and pushed aside. And at the end of the day, the Taliban are indigenous to Afghanistan. They represent, they're they composed of the largest minority group, and they're about half of that group. So how are you going to have peace in that country? Um, and I always point out, just as a very popular example of this, but um, at the end of the day, the troubles were solved through a political process whereby everyone came to the table, and eventually the queen met Martin McGuinness, who <laughs> killed one of her family members, right? So where would the, the political process in Northern Ireland be if you've never talked to the IRA, right? There are obviously parameters, right, um, established, but the Taliban were not considered legitimate, were not including them. There was never a peace to be held, um, and so then it makes the development side very difficult and the state building side very difficult. And Afghanistan has had, uh, you could read, I have been, uh, Barnett Rubin, uh, state fragmentation in Afghanistan. It is never. It, it's. It's not a backward. It's not a backwards place. It has just never been. A, it has never been a classic cohesive state, for a variety of domestic political reasons um, that are not less sophisticated uh, than anywhere else in the world, but just are complicated. And there's not majority groups, and so it's fractured. And that made state formation, taxation, and centralization of power, and monopoly on the use of force difficult. And that was not achieved either during our time. Right. That was highly problematic. We also in our uh, engagement in the, the implementation of the political settlement, essentially drawn up by the Afghans in the lawyer Jurga, uh, we conflated order and justice. And we went in claiming that we were going to help make a more just society, and unfortunately, again, to create a permissive environment to facilitate development or the presence of the troops to help the development, who knows. 
Um, we brought in the pow back into power a lot of the warlords who had actually destroyed the country mm. in the 90s. And that greatly uh, undermined the Western efforts, right? Um, and Afghans were looking around and saying, well, what, what's happened here? Because you know, the, the, I don't know if you know how the Taliban started, but basically um, there was a young woman who um, was raped and murdered uh, in southern Afghanistan. And this was a frequent occurrence during the Civil War after the Soviets left. And the Taliban were like, this is, this, no, no more of this. And they went and got the, they knew who had done it. They executed them. And they said, there is not going to be any more of this lawlessness, right? And that's why they came to power relatively quickly, because they were restoring, it was a brutal order, but it was order and some form of justice. And what we then did was we put a lot of these warlords back in power, and the Afghans were going, whoa, whoa. What is this, right? So, you know, it's easy to say black and white, the Taliban were terrible. I'm not, they're not, I'm not fans, but you have the, those complexities were really ignored. And we actually uh, replicated um, uh, the tragedy of the 1990s in Afghanistan. Um, the liberal international order, right? And what are the wider implications, just to pull away a bit from this uh, nose dive into Afghanistan, pardon that, that, that term maybe. Um, well, I think that the, the, and you draw this out well in the book, I think you could have done more, I think you should have had a chapter on drones and extrajudicial killing more specifically, not just on, oh sorry. yeah. Sorry, no, it's fine. Um, I wrote a book on it. Next time you need a chapter, call me. Uh, so, but I mean, but this was the whole thing is the liberal world order, and I hate to be crude mean here, but the liberal world order is not very liberal, right? And you're, you're actually seeing that, um, there's a great example last week, uh, the US Department of Defense, don't tell us about the war crimes in Ukraine. Did you hear that? But what war crimes? No, nope. no war crimes. Why don't they want the help? Does anyone know why they don't want help? They're worried that this might set a precedent for perhaps it to be used, turned against the United States. So what what happened to that liberal international order? So this is a very contemporary example. But the, the problem was the U.S. and Caroline drew this out, and it's drawn out also in the OAF chapter, right? The the problem of a terror uh, a hunt, terrorist hunting mission uh, that uses all forms of um, uh, military means and uh, co uh, covert operations as well, plus the, the wider operation in the region, right? Repeated use of drones for extrajudicial killing, uh, the incarceration of individuals without any due process. Um, and again, it's, it, it was interesting, I mentioned Professor Calmer in our previous chat before we came here, is I remain perplexed why so many Obama supporters, and I was one for full disclosure, but was very disillusioned having worked on this campaign on this issue, that when he came to office and having criticized, everyone was incensed with Guantanamo, rightly so. Um, but they didn't seem to have a problem with all of the extrajudicial killing. I was like, well, when you incarcerate people in Guantanamo, they're still alive. It's not excusing it, but they're alive. Uh, <laughs> President Obama has decided that him and the Attorney General are due process. It's not. Um, and they decide who could be killed, including if you have a U.S. passport, which, by the way, what about so-called universal values? It shouldn't matter if you have a U.S. passport, right? <laughs> so if you're a human being, right, who's deciding on, under what evidence and what conditions you, you should, your life should be terminated? Well, it's not very liberal, is it, right? And there's a whole, I could go on, um, but this is a problem, and, and it, it's repeated today. I think this is partly why you see uh, so much of the global south um, saying they don't really like what's happening in Ukraine, but not vociferously running to the side of the West, um, because, and, and I brought this up at one point, and uh, Tomas Ilvis, the former uh, president of Estonia, attacked me for somehow saying that I was justifying Russia, which I'm not, but I just pointed out that we did this in Iraq. I said, you should probably ask the families of 150,000 dead Iraqis how they feel about what we did there. Um, so, you know, I think that this is a problem, right? It's, and there's a great article I would encourage you to read. It just came out in Foreign Affairs by Aisha Zarkul at Cambridge and George Lawson on the hypocrisy of the international order. And what they're basically arguing there is that, you know, a liberal international order portends, and Caroline brought this up, um, sort of equality, but it's actually, it's a hierarchical system and it's not a just system. States are not all the same. They're not all equal. It's never been uh, an equal system. And, but the problem is the liberal national order purports to be this, but there is not a mechanism for redress, right? Am I okay on time? Am I doing yeah, right? Right. And so that's I'm a... I'm being that's totally no problem. a total tolerant check. 
Anarchist. A <laughs> um, At TTC. Um, so I think that this is a major problem. And this, in, in this mission, right, that, that it, it highlights these challenges. And I think, again, also for when you think about the elites, everyone in this room pretty much is an elite in, in uh, a shape or form. And then you think about the public fields, right? Um, why did our children die there? Why did those people's children die in that country uh, our children were fighting? Uh, why are we carrying the tax burden, the welfare burdens of soldiers we have to care for, right? And I think there's a lot of skepticism among the electorate, and, a big, and there's a big movement in the United States um, funded with money, interestingly, from the right and the left to rethink this engagement. It's often labeled restra the restrainer point of view. Um, and I'm not sure where that exactly fits in terms of realism. Uh, there's some overlap there. But it's this whole idea that the US should pull back from the world. And they're very informed by Afghanistan, by Iraq, uh, and, of, of, and they're very against what's happened, against Western support for Ukraine. And so that would have very large implications. And I, it's interesting because I think they've actually over-egged the pudding, right, regarding uh, taking lessons from Iraq and Afghanistan and transferring them to Ukraine, which are not comparable situations. And because John Mearsheimer says what he says, because he's on an Iraq war hangover. He was right about the, the, the idiocy of the Iraq war. Um, but he is then saying, because we were trying to impose literally that order on Iraq. Whereas in Ukraine, it's a bottom-up movement. And although imperfect, with lots of corruption uh, and halting progress, it's a, it's a bottom-up movement. Yes, there was some international support, and we probably were too overt in terms of the praise of the revolutions, but it's indigenous, right? The Ukrainians want a different future, and that's what they're pushing for. And so I think they're actually drawing uh, uh, false comparisons. Uh, but it will have real implications. There's a real push to scale back and or end or not even have started support for Ukraine. And Ukraine is a different kettle of fish, but it does relate to these wider order issues. Mm. Um, let me think of how much time do I have, Mary? I think we should finish very soon. Okay, yeah. so discussion's even good. better. No, I like that. So, and I just want to also, you know, the other challenge to just highlight the liberalism of Yemen, right? When everything was going on, the US assistance to Saudi Arabia, with a brutal war in Yemen, uh, Libya, so if you believe in R2P, which I do really like R2P, but Libya was a disaster for R2P. We actually got a mandate from the UN that Russians and Chinese allowed us to do a uh, no-fly zone over Benghazi, and within a couple months, well, Gaddafi must go because he's a terrible person. Well, we'll never get any authorization to do that again, will we? Right? So we undermine the liberal international order. Um, and, and Syria? Uh, Kurds in northern Iraq as well, by the way. So abandonment, I think the abandonment issues, and I'll close on that for now and I can bring some other points. You know, the, what's the legacy for the United States um, and its, and its uh, you know, sort of approach to this? Um, and I think the takeaway is, and it goes back to my first point, that U.S. interests are not synonymous with Afghan interests. Um, and they were not synonymous with those of the Kurds. Right? Um, or anywhere else the US chose to intervene. And this is my takeaway for uh, my Ukrainian friends when I talk to them about how they want to think about the conflict and when they, when they may want to negotiate or when they're in a position of strength is that US interests in Ukraine and Western interests in Ukraine are not synonymous with Ukrainian interests. And we don't talk about that much, but they're not. We may think, we may want to think they are, but they're not. Um, and that will become more evident as, as the conflict goes on. And so I think that there's this legacy that in the end, you know, the U.S., I think the, the commitment of U.S. engagement um, is, is highly questionable, right? Um, and we could have scaled down and withdrawn and retrograded in a much more responsible fashion. There was no need to do it in the precipitous manner that it was done. And it just goes to sh sort of highlight the uh, sort of the emptiness of some realist thought because, of course, domestic politics drove that withdrawal. And I'll stop there. Gosh, thank you. Um, so I want to say a few things, and I know Nick does too. Well, it's just a, a couple, what, one on the, because you mentioned Northern Ireland, as I happened to live there for 22 years, I wrote about it uh, with Fiona, my wife, over there, and we brought out a book which went into a second edition with Manchester University Press some years ago. So interesting to kind of draw that point is, because I think it is worth, there's two things I'd take away from parallels carefully. One is that repressive state action can create the opposition that it's trying to stop. Uh, I put it rather bluntly that British state policy within Northern Ireland in between 1970 and 1972 did a huge amount to create the provisional IRA. It, were, it existed anyway, there was a Republican tradition went right back to the 19th century, into 1916. But I'm absolutely no doubt, but it's my own view anyway, 
the degree to which the British state used repression, you know, the equivalent of our, you know, using repression as you were describing it, creates the opposition which you're trying to undermine. Um, and, and it took the British and the Irish governments together with others years to, to, to come back from that. I know, Caroline has also written about that. So, you know, I think whether we agree on that, I don't know. The, the second thing is about the peace process in Northern Ireland, again, about which I have quite a vested interest. Um, it's an interesting question as to why what was done in Northern Ireland in the 1990s, concluding with the Good Friday Agreement, why that proved to be not possible? Because basically, I mean, again, I don't want to oversimplify, but in essence, uh, you had what you had one or two options. The war was never; it was going to go on forever. Otherwise, nobody could win it. Neither the British Army could win it, and certainly uh, the British IRA could win it. And a certain, at a certain point, you kind of recognised there was no winning. Um, the, the the real issue then is how could you draw the British IRA into the into 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 agreeing to a, a permanent long term ceasefire. And of course, they did it by varieties of means, and it was easier to do there than I'm sure drawing the Taliban in, in in Afghanistan. So maybe it's not an easy easy analogy to to do. But the question I'd really raise is why was it so difficult to draw the Taliban? Because one of the chapters in the book itself is actually highly critical, saying why didn't you include them mm -hmm. yeah, in some yeah. kind of? And you you hinted at that yourself. I'd be interested to hear what your answers. Are, are on that. So thanks for that analogy, and it's worth thinking about, even if it's not exact. And I, I know, I know that. The other thing is consequences and double standards, and I think you raised that point, and I think obviously you did too, Caroline. There's no doubt when thinking about connecting the war in Ukraine, perceptions of that war in Ukraine, how that war is perceived, where we sit, where people in southern Africa sit, or in Latin America sit, or in parts of Southeast Asia sit. How they perceive the global south, if to use that term, which I'm not entirely happy with, but you get my point. Why is it that they see that in a rather different way? I'm not saying they support the war necessarily, but they perceive. And it is, I think it does get back to what happened in Iraq, what happened in Afghanistan, but what happened in Libya, particularly. You know, time and Putin has been, exploited that double standards argument very effectively, actually. In, in his propaganda to sell the line about about the Ukraine. Well, in other words, all of these things will in the end all have consequences. And those consequences, I think, have come back to hit the Western liberal claim that somehow or another what is happening in Ukraine is a just war, which I actually think it is, by the way, that's another question. Um, but, you know, selling that line outside of the West is proving extraordinarily difficult. And I think we have to understand why it is. It's not just because Putin is a genius at communication. It is that he has a story to tell based on what he thinks is in the double standards. But isn't it also the power? Sorry? Isn't it also goes yeah. back to what Caroline said? Is that smaller, that's the right word, small states, uh, states lower in the hierarchy of international relations recognize yeah. that great powers do what they want, and the US did it and got away with it, and Russia's doing it, and they think it's lamentable in all the cases, and they don't feel that they need to stick their necks out for, for this one, you know, and, they, and some have condemned, but varying degrees, and I think that's a, pre a pretty accurate assessment, right? I mean, it hate to be brutal, but I mean, well, you know. You know. Let, let, I want to say something. As, sorry. Yeah, that's okay, that's fine. So you're absolutely right about how repressive actions produce a response. And it was not just that the Taliban weren't included. The Taliban actually wanted to surrender. Yes, you're right. But they were never given the opportunity nope. to exactly. surrender. And the Americans paid the warlords to chase them. So they had to reform. Yep. I mean, they either had to defend themselves or leave, or it was an impossible situation. And actually, remember, the insurgency didn't begin until 2006. Yes. Mm -hmm. And similarly, in Iraq, I mean, the Americans basically walked in with the consent of the Iraqis. Nobody resisted. And then they started, I mean, they didn't start, but wherever they thought there were resistance, they started their attacks from the air. So in a way, there was no choice but to start an insurgency. So, you know, I think that point, which is something they don't seem to understand, that attacks produce counterattacks, yes. 
is yeah, something that isn't really properly I, I, understood. I can't tell you how many of my students, when I was teaching at Queen's University of Belfast, I won't name names, but very many of them who, who became increasingly sympathetic to provisional IRA after Bloody Sunday, January yeah. 1972, when 13, 14 people, innocent people, were shot dead in Derry. They, they said, right, we're going to join up, we've got no alternative, we're interment without trial. Once you engage in those kinds of repressive policies, it's going, to, it's going to create greater tragedy and greater problems for you to deal with. It took the British 20 years to work out how to get out of that situation. And they need a lot of advice, both from yeah. people in Northern Ireland and, of course, from, from, from the Republic of Ireland and Dublin itself. So, yeah, I'm going to ask people, but I just wanted to make a couple of other points. I mean, first, secondly, I think you're absolutely right about the justice. And one of the things that happened in Afghanistan was that everybody said, we all want civil society, mm -hmm. and we're going to pour money into civil mm -hmm. society. So, but what was really important was listening to civil society, mm -hmm. because in all of the conflicts I study, there is a strong civil society. They're the, I mean, the, they're the people who are really thinking about their situation. They're, people, they're not necessarily NGOs, they're just trusted people. I call it civicists, teachers, doctors. And whenever, and what's really important is hearing their perspective, because they have a better perspective than anyone else about how to end the conflict. And whenever they had meetings with the international community, they all said, we think the only solution is justice. And nobody ever took any notice. They were quite ready to pour out money into yeah. civil society, but they never would take any notice on the justice issue. And I think the reason is that the warlords were the CIA's um, contacts during the Soviet period. And they were never willing to give that up. And that's one of the reasons why we have to think of domestic mm -hmm. situations and take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Then thirdly, on the drones, I couldn't agree with what we were discussing it beforehand and we feel really strongly and I can't understand why there isn't more public fuss about but the incredible thing is the Americans say they've withdrawn from Afghanistan, but they're still doing the strikes. I mean, there is no end to this war. It's just unbelievable, and nobody seems to be raising that point. They haven't withdrawn, actually. All they've done is to withdraw people on the ground. And uh, then I finally wanted to make a point about Libya. Yeah, I do think Libya was a bit of a disaster because it was done with airstrikes. But one thing I would say is that NATO destroyed Gaddafi's heavy weapons. And in Syria, both Assad and Russia were able to continue really horrendous bombing. Bombing with barrel bombs, bombing with schools and hospitals. And that simply wasn't possible in Libya. And I think people often miss that point. Um, I mean, what they did was really stupid because they allied with these militias on the ground. And interestingly, the chief of staff of the EU had a different idea of what should be done. In other words, his idea was that where there were liberated areas, you should just help to defend them rather than attacking them. And that might have worked. It was a different approach. So I think it's worth rethinking. Libya. I won't go on any longer because we've literally only got 15 minutes left. And I'm going to see if anybody would like to ask a question. Sure. There's somebody just here in the front. Somebody at the back as well. And somebody at the back. And you'd like to ask me. Would you like to say something? Me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get paid. The <laughs> Socratic method was chosen. <laughs> I think just a shout. Yeah, yeah, just shout. Yeah. I can shout. I, yeah, as long as it's there, I think I picked up the mics from the recording. Yeah, okay. Cool. Uh, thank you very much, all, for a really, really interesting discussion. I just wanted to unpack a little bit more on the uh, American withdrawal itself um, and the way in which it was done and the speed at which it was done. 
I mean, I think um, you know most people were pretty surprised at uh, the speed at which um, the, the Taliban did take over. And I think one of the one sort of criticism I've heard quite a lot is, um, you know, if 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 uh, the Americans hadn't done it at all, what would have changed on the term? Would have just been there indefinitely? I think is a sort of argument I've kind of heard quite a lot. I just uh, wondered sort of uh, what your reaction to that would be. You know, what could they have done instead? Was it just a case of doing the same thing but slower and, and better? Um, welcome any thoughts on that? Maybe Mike should have. Do you think the US state would have just gone on in forever? Is that what you're I think that that's an argument I've heard, I've heard, yeah. Yeah, so the, you know, the, <clears throat> they, the NATO, the mission at, NATO mission had ended. Um, the US presence was relatively small uh, by comparison. And they could have taken a disrupt the grid approach, right, to the to the operation, which is sort of where they were anyways, which was providing training to the Afghans and then air support and some assistance, right? Um, and the air support made a big difference because the Taliban obviously didn't have any air power. Um, so that gave the Afghan national security forces an upper hand. And the U.S. could have done that financially and in terms of, uh, I don't want to say this callously, but manpower expenditure. I think the last two years of the presence, 24 our soldiers were killed, which is obviously very regrettable, but also if you put it into um, comparison, it's not a, a lot, right? If you think it's in the interest, I don't know, security interest, moral interest, right? Um, and I think that's part why many people were upset, because we could have probably done something a little different. But even if we wanted to still leave, we could have, and actually, well, the problem was, the agreement that was negotiated was a terrible agreement anyways. And I mean, I don't know why, because Donald Trump negotiated it. So it should have been Trump, yes. the most leadingest agreement ever, right, to fail, to lose in a war. Um, but it was a bad agreement. And um, there should have been reassessments of what progress was being done and what wasn't. And we should have probably slow rolled the retrograde. Um, and given the Afghan National Security Forces more time and assistance. And what ultimately happened was the, the, the government, though, had no faith in its own security forces. And essentially, because we were running for the doors, ran for the doors as well, and there wasn't much. And the Afghans figured, well, my bread is buttered on that side, and very quickly melted away because there was no point to fight, right? What were they really fighting? And it goes, this goes back to order and justice issues and, you know, and, you know how many... I don't know how many cars like Ashraf Ghani, you know, has done wonderful work in the West, but, you know, he's about as, in some ways, I hate to say, as Afghan as I am, right? You, you fly in an Afghan expat to run the country, and you saw how attached he was, right, uh, based on his uh, rapid withdrawal. So, I, you know, we, think we could have stayed, but the point is, as Mary brought up, it would have been forever, because no one could have gotten superiority in that, right? Taliban shoot, you know, U.S. shoots, or the ANF, SF shoot, but there would have been no end to it. So at some point, it maybe needed to end, but... We could have definitely rescaled the retrograde much more competently. Um, well, and I, I mean, if I can add, it was just ridiculous. They had negotiations between Trump and the Taliban, yep. and they left out the entire Afghan. Afghan society. In 2017, civil society were really pressing for talks. They wanted talks between the government and the Taliban. Not only that, but they were also pressing for the international community to come in and promote local agreements, which is what the Taliban did, in order to establish their authority. So there, this is the legacy of the Trump years. But the Biden administration should have recognized that. You know, it was always said that the agreement between Trump and the Taliban would be followed by all Afghan talks. Those all Afghan talks never took place. And that is completely shocking. Yeah. And so that, you know, there should have been all Afghan talks. We should have had something like the Good Friday Agreement. We should have had security guarantees so that the war couldn't continue. The idea was to end a war, not to let the Taliban take and the U.S. stopped those because the U.S. had the view that they were terrorist admissions. So we were pushing against that, even when Afghan civil yeah. society wanted to start bringing them in to figure things out. So that was a very black and white approach that backfired spectacularly. I'm going to take two more, because I think we've only got 10 minutes, and then I should let everybody. So there's one at the back, and then I'm going to take. So uh, thank you. Yeah, can really you interesting. speak loudly? So thank you. Some really interesting perspectives. Uh, my question is, how do you in this theatre? How do you separate the? How do you separate liberal internationalism from the clash of civilizations from Huntington? Wow. <laughs> well, ten minutes. <laughs> 
I had to, to answer it the other day. Where was I? In Poland. Oh, no. And they were talking about Western culture, so I'll come back to it in a minute. But first, you. Well, I, I, I don't have any question apart from how to make the world a better place. Um, the only thing I can say is that thank you very much. This is fantastic um, for me, especially for me, um, because what we've been talking about is theories of international relations and having been on the ground, as it were, on the implementation side in the military and in the FCO. Um, one of the areas that uh, really um, interests me is that um, social scientists are handicapped by the fact that their data set is probably the only data set that is not just incomplete but actively trying to mislead them. Mm -hmm. And what we have are statements made as to why we're doing things which are deliberately put out. And one of the things I think uh, you mentioned, Michael, was um, about the reasons why um, we got involved in Afghanistan. Well, the reasons why we got involved in Afghanistan was simply because we'd screwed up in Iraq as a, as a British you know, as a British military, we were humiliated, and that's why uh, John Reed said, gentlemen, to all the um, senior officers in the room at the time, we've done all we can in Iraq. Uh, Afghanistan is a war on drugs, and it's a war we can win. And so we know where that led. So that was, if you like, the, the overarching thing, notwithstanding the fact, yes, very good people were out there trying no, no. to do good things, yes. but that wasn't the purpose. No. I think that's one thing we need to remember. The other thing I think is really important, I think you touched on it, all of you to varying degrees, is the world um, is split into two. And a lot of what we're talking about is the Western perspective on the world. The West has caused enormous wars that the rest of the world has had to endure, either through intervention or through um, bringing people in, you know, from the colonies during the First and Second World War. And that's one of the reasons why people are a bit cynical. Um, they don't believe uh, that the West is doing anything for liberal intent. Of course, there are nice people trying to do that, but as a state, that isn't, they know it's not the reality. Uh, when I um, spoke at a conference after the, the Afghanistan war started, uh, it happened to be, uh, uh, ironically, in the, in the church, the chapel at Sandhurst about the Afghan war. And the brilliant thing about the chapel was that they had stained glass windows. And the number of stained glass windows that were commemorating campaigns that the British had been involved in, in <laughs> Afghanistan, war. ironic. <laughs> I sat in Kabul with a colonel from the police, and after having pizza and um, chai for a long time, I asked him the question, um, what do you think of the future? This is in t uh, 2011, uh, 12. And he had this embarrassed laugh. He said, you know, when I was a young man, we were at war. We're at war today, so in the future we'll be at war. And that reflects the cultural reality. They know the Brits, the Soviets, and others will come, and then they'll go. So you're not going to leave anything behind. And, and there are some you know, uh, other practicalities when you talk about how the liberal intervention actually isn't um, really uh, in the state's interest, because the state isn't an entity. There is the military-industrial complex, and a lot of people made a lot of money out of this war. Um, you know, one of the things I was trying to deal with is the problem of the fact that the Americans have put in more police cars per policeman in Afghanistan than anywhere else in the world. Why were they doing that? Because they had money that they needed to recirculate through the American economy. And, and you know, these things are quite amusing. But when you realize that money should have gone to the starving people. Final point is we remember the tragedies that the West can visualize. And we look upon that exit as, oh my god, that was a tragic exit. This, whilst they were showing those pictures, if you go back, the BBC showed interviews of men and women crying because they had left Kandahar where the clinics had been bombed. And who was bombing? The only people that could have been bombing 
were the West, uh, the American forces, and we didn't even investigate that. So there is a, you know, this war. There was no one in Mazar Sharif too, wasn't there? Uh, the MSF, wasn't yeah. the MSF. That was a, yeah, that was one that was publicised, yeah. but nobody explored the bombing of clinics in Kandahar 48 hours before the, the, the evacuation. There was a question at the back about clash of civilizations. Yes, and I'm, I'm the chair. No, I know. I'm just, <laughs> you want to answer the question? No, too, I'm you? not going to answer the question. I'm going to ask each of you to answer the question and say anything they want to say, starting uh, with Michael and ending oh, with you. And oh, I'll let myself oh, add <laughs> if we have to. I think we're supposed to reconcile <laughs> law and national order with the clash of civilizations. How do you separate? Yeah. separate yeah. So Michael, it's this over time. to you. Well, you. Anything else you want to add as a final? I say I'm not a fan of the clash of civilizations of uh, thesis. I don't think it was having his best work. Um, but I, I would definitely say that Vladimir Putin is trying to cast uh, the war in Ukraine um, as the defense of civilization, um, and he's, in my view, he's actually trying to cast it uh, for his own purposes as uh, not not European, but of traditional conservative European values, right? Which also find more resonance abroad, right? Um, and where the men are men, and the women are in the kitchens, and there are no gay people, and et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and sort of the, you know, the woke West is decrepit and has no pride, and so, you know, they want to do that to all of us. Um, and there's a lot of sympathetic ears in the Western world, too, right? Just watch Tucker Carlson on Fox News. Um, <laughs> so I think wow. that, um, you know, that's, that's where that comes in, is that I think, you know, there's this rhetoric to attempt to, to, to sort of put it into a civilizational struggle. Um, that's a massive, excellent question, though. Um, but I... Um, and one more thinking about that, but that's a very uh, weak answer for the time being. Um, but I'll and leave it there so that everyone else has time. Caroline. Oh, you can't separate them. Impossible. <laughs> Anything else you want to say? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. So what I, what I would point to, which I think becomes apparent from being on the ground with people in Afghanistan, is the huge human tragedies. Um, if you look at Ukraine and Vladimir Putin's miscalculation, so if the conservative estimates of 100,000 dead on the Russian side are there, there was already a shortage of men in Russia. Mm -hmm. There are now 20 women to every man in Russia. So the consequences are going to be huge. One of the reasons it's something we touched on, historically the West has not put women on the battlefield is because we've recognised you need women to reproduce after any ghastly war. But there's going to be a problem if this war grinds on, because the demography is completely against Vladimir Putin's ultra-Russian nationalist rhetoric. And even before this war, um, the in-migration from Central Asia into the cities in Russia was huge. And so he's got a massive problem, which is why I think if you look at the way the fighting is, is taking place. Ukraine's also going to have a problem in terms of replenishing its society afterwards. So the human consequences are immense. Um, and I don't think we've calibrated in that rush to fight to the last Ukrainian. I mean, this is a proxy war as much as any other war for the West. That's my concern. OK, Nick. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to answer the question on cl Clash of Civilization by Sam Huntington, I'm not sure, back in 92 or 3, uh, and liberalism. I mean, in his own mind, uh, Sam Huntington, he wasn't such a bad political scientist, although he had some pretty odd views on certain things. Like, I a little off the deep end at the end of the Well, no, I agree. I just say, I said he wasn't a bad political scientist. I'm not sure that's a compliment to him, but there we go. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he saw this as a kind of an attack on liberalism. You know, the, all these damn liberals with their ideas of the end of history, Fukuyama, globalization is going to solve all your problems, that economics is going to kind of pull us all together into one happy lifeboat called the world market. I think his was simply an attempt from a, you know, kind of strictly realist point of view, which he essentially was, you know, to refute that particular argument. Now, you know, I attended so many conferences in the 1990s telling everybody, and I went along with this, of course, and in fact, I've all speaking agreed, saying, well, what a stupid theory. 
clash of civilizations. You know, I mean, so many things wrong with it. Our old friend here, Fred Halliday, no longer with us, you know, wrote, wrote a wonderful book attacking the whole theory of clash of civilizations. So, well, I'm not since it wasn't historical in other terms as well. The only, the only thing I'd say, and this is not me endorsing it, simply say, but nonetheless, that kind of idea kind of had an influence. You know, it kind of percolated down into the DNA of quite a lot of people thinking about what 9-11 was about, what the war on terror was about, and I think it's pretty insidious, its consequences, but its impact was nonetheless, I think, very, very, very real, and that's anything I can say on that one. On the, um, I just want to draw maybe a connection between the Ukraine war and Afghanistan as well. Look, there's many, many explanations as to why Putin finally did what he did. Uh, on February 24th of 2022, and I don't want to rehearse them all. So there's so many different explanations of that. But there is a view out there, and um, that in somehow or another, he saw a declining West, uh, a, a, a fragmented West, and Brexit being part of that fragmentation as well, Mary, by the way. Just to which he contributed. Uh, well, yeah, no, no, I don't care about that. But, you know, the whole fragmentation of the West, yeah. the decline of the West, and, and, and the American withdrawal from Afghanistan. Now, I, I have no idea what goes on in Putin's head, and the more I read speeches, the less I'm wondering if he's actually in contact with reality or he's taking certain kinds of drugs, I don't know. But nonetheless, there is a, there is a, a persistent theme in much of what he's saying. It isn't just the things you said, Michael, are absolutely right. But he's saying... I think that underneath it, there was a sense that he could get away with oh, this. Yeah. He could get away with this in Ukraine. Not just because the army was so strong, or the Ukrainian military had been so penetrated by the Russian FSB or whatever, but that somehow or another, Afghanistan showed to him that there was no deterrence, putting it rather in old-fashioned IR terms, yeah? Which I might feel a bit uncomfortable with, Mary may feel a bit uncomfortable with, but that may well have been within his brain. And that seeing... Other things going on in the West, including including Brexit, including what he thought was fragmentation in the European Union, etc. He may have thought, I can get away with this, this is my time. So there may actually, and I'll end here, there may have been therefore a, a connection between what finally happened in Afghanistan and the decision making which finally led to the utterly disastrous decision, both the, for Russia and but more obviously for Ukraine and what he did on February. 4th of 2022. And also the annexation of Crimea with very yeah. little international response. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. And he did get away with Crimea. Yeah. He did. He did. And he did get away with Syria. So it was perfectly to be expected. Yeah. So I just wanted to say two things. One about the clash of civilizations. I think there is, if you like, a difference between the idea of a world organized on the basis of multilateralism and human rights, and the idea of a world organized on the relations between great powers. But I don't, and, and if you like, the first one is liberal internationalism, but it doesn't fit with the West at all. You know, I think the EU is much more closer to the multilateral, Canada is, South Africa is, Japan is, you know, and it's a different kind of contradiction in the world. And we tend to look at the world in terms of the conflict between mm. um, the great powers. But there's something else going on, I think, at the same time. And of course, the conflict with the great powers influences all that. But I think it's a huge mistake to think that West, the West equals liberal internationalism, unless you have a very cynical view of what liberal internationalism is, because clearly the West does not behave in liberal internationalist ways. Um, I wanted to say one other thing, which is I think one of the ridiculous things about Afghanistan was the way in which governments perceived their publics, because their argument was always, both the American and the British, was that they were really in Afghanistan to, um, I don't know, get rid of terrorists. I mean, the argument made in this country was, we're trying to make our streets safer. And actually, the reason that some people were in Afghanistan 
was in fact to make Afghanistan safer. And had they said, we're in Afghanistan to make Afghanistan safer, I think actually it would have, they would have found themselves in a much better situation. And not only in Afghanistan, but also at home. I mean, I oh, think yeah. the public are nice enough to recognize that's a good aim. And they aren't entirely selfish. And it was a bit unconvincing to say, because actually none of us think that any of these things made our streets safer. On the contrary, right, they yes. made our streets much less safe. So that was a really stupid argument. And anyway, I just wanted to add that as, as a general point. But in general, thanks everybody for a really great discussion. And see you again sometime. Thanks very much, everybody. Could I get one final point before we depart, just to say the books actually on sale. I wish it were free, but we live in the LSE capitalist world, don't we? So uh, I, I think it's a very reasonable seventeen pound or something over there in the corner. So if you could, or I was told this is a subversive bit. Get a leaflet. Go to the thing there in the corner, and you can download it as a PDF for free. So you can either spend 17 quid or get it for free by downloading it. By, by, I'm not quite sure what you're going to do. And I'm not quite sure what I'm suggesting you ought to do. But anyway, again, thank you for coming along. I'd also like to thank the contributors of our here tonight and those who are not. And I think this is a subject that we've simply got to keep talking about. Uh, overshadowed as it is by another great tragedy. So nonetheless, it's one that I don't think we should forget. Uh, uh, the worst thing ever. And if you could fill in the forms, that would be very, very good. So thank you again for coming along tonight. Thanks, everybody.